on site the R9 3900X and R7 3700X that we're also reviewing, AMD launched its R5 3600 today to the public. We got a production sample of one of the R5 3600 CPUs through a third party, and after seeing its performance, we wanted to focus first on this one for our initial Ryzen 3000 review. This CPU is supposed to be a $200 part. We've been recommending AMD's R5 CPUs since the first generation, as Intel's i5 CPUs have seen struggles lately in frame time consistency and are often close enough to AMD that the versatility, frame time consistency, and close enough gaming performance have warranted R5 purchases. Today we're revisiting with the R5 3600 6 core 12 thread CPU to look at gaming, production workloads like Premiere, Blender, and V-Ray, and more, power consumption, and overclocking. Before that, this video is brought to you by Gigabyte's X570 Aorus Master Motherboard, built with a true 14-phase VRM and for high-end Ryzen 3000 series builds. The Gigabyte X570 Master uses a properly finned heatsink for VRM cooling, accompanied by RGB LEDs in the I.O. cover to mix looks and performance. Gigabyte also includes BIOS flash features to update the motherboard BIOS without a CPU or RAM. The overbuilt VRM is the major feature on this board, though, and Gigabyte has a brand new BIOS for overclocking the new Ryzen 3000 series CPUs. Learn more at the link in the description below. A couple of quick notes on this. This CPU was not sent out by AMD, and so this is a production sample, but it's from a third party, and that means that you probably won't see too many of these reviews just yet, but they are going to be sold. So. Uh, these will be $200 to the R5 3600. There's an X SKU as well. The X SKU has a 200 megahertz higher advertised boost frequency, whereas this one's at 3200. That would be at 3400 megahertz. So those are the main differences. That there's a price difference as well. But just like previous generations, where you can buy the non X SKU and then overclock it to match the X SKU, that's basically the only difference. It's the frequency, and everything else is the same between the X SKU 3600 and the non X SKU. So you could buy this one and overclock it, or uh, because we've already overclocked it in our charts, you can look at that data and then extrapolate where the X would land if you do prefer that one. Our 3900X and 3700X overclocked with much better voltages, although the same frequency, than our 3600. And some of that is potentially because of the higher end CPUs requiring higher quality silicon. So that's part of it, probably. Uh, we'll note also that the CPUs AMD sent had thermal paste left on them, so something to take note of as well. But uh, our 3600, although it overclocked reasonably, it did require a lot more voltage than our 3900X. We'll talk about that more in the 3900X review, which is coming up after this one and after our 5700X T review. So uh, those are the main notes. Other than that, all Windows updates up to 1903 have been applied for our new CPU test bench. And BIOS mitigations have been applied for Intel CPUs. We're on the latest BIOS for just about everything, unless there was just a reason not to. For example, the AMD BIOS is for Ryzen 3000. There are a couple that are questionable right now. So for BIOS, we're using FC5 for the Gigabyte X570 Master. That's the motherboard we used for all of our new Ryzen testing that you'll be seeing this week. And we do have other boards as well, but we're starting with that one. The F clock is another thing I wanted to mention. So the Infinity Fabric clock is going to be a big part of overclocking for this generation of Ryzen from what we understand. We've done some F-clock overclocking, and it won't be included in this review because without also overclocking the memory, it doesn't really do a whole lot, and uh, at least versus auto. So we're going to be visiting F-clock in a separate piece, and we're also doing some XOC liquid nitrogen overclocking, hopefully this week with Ryzen and the X570 CPU. So we'll have a lot of depth on that coming up as we tinker with it with liquid nitrogen. Timings for this updated bench have been very heavily controlled. So we've improved our test bench and our testing methodology significantly for this round of testing. We are now manually controlling more or less every single timing in BIOS before we did the important ones, but now we've controlled all of them. So uh, RFC, for example, can have a pretty big impact. And it's to the extent that it, it just it tightens the error margins. So it's an extra plus or minus 1% closer every time we do the runs, and now sometimes it's 0.1 FPS different run to run, which is fantastic. Let's get straight into it. We like to illustrate CPU behavior on new architecture launches. Part of this is to look for boost duration limitations or power fluctuations, something we'll cover next. The first chart shows frequency over time with a Blender workload, which is a 3D rendering application hitting all cores nearly equally. The average all-core frequency ends up at about 4104 megahertz, 
The CPU was under a 280mm CLC with 22 degree ambient for this test, so boost behavior was not thermally affected. The CPU has an advertised boost clock of 4200 MHz, which will apply for workloads that don't fully load the cores at 100%. There's minimal fluctuation with this frequency plot, and it does not appear that any boost duration limits come into play. Boost duration limits are typically close to the 100 second mark, for example. For a better view of this, we'll plot each core clock individually and with the y-axis constrained to just 4050 to 4200 MHz. The point of this is to magnify the data. As observed here, pre-testing starts with cores bouncing off of the 4200 MHz limited core turbo while still in idle. Once the work begins, the cores take turns bursting up to 4125 MHz and falling back to 4100, with rare dips down to 4080. We'll keep drawing other cores as we go here. There doesn't seem to be a preference for which core boosts up to 4125, they all do it at some point. A pattern emerges where cores 0 and 1 will pass the ball back and forth, and then on to cores 4 and 5 and 2 and 3 seem to do similar. At the end of the day, they all take turns boosting. We'll use Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p to give a gaming look at frequency behavior. We'll also skip straight to the zoomed in chart for a better highlight of the boosting. In this chart, we stay closer to an average of 4175 MHz boost when under heavier loads. With the lighter threaded scenes rendered, we see single core boosts up to 4200 MHz, the maximum stock boost, before falling back to 4150 to 4175. As for the core number 5 dip below the chart range, that spike falls to about 3300 MHz. We use two of Total Warhammer 2's baked in benchmarks, starting with Battle, designed to test performance on the RTS map. We also test with the campaign for a look at turn based vantage points. Strategy games are a good place to demonstrate performance for CPUs as AI processing is often CPU intensive. The higher-end Intel CPUs at 1080p approach a GPU bottleneck with a maximum average FPS of 174 for the 5.1 GHz 9900K. AMD's R5 2600 and R5 1600 came nowhere close to this limit previously, with the overclocked 4.2 GHz 2600 maxing out at 145 FPS average. The R5 3600 makes a big step towards closing that gap with a stock average of 159 FPS, a 27.3% improvement over the stock 1600, and a 10% improvement over the overclocked 2600 4.2 GHz score. Overclocking the 3600 yielded a minor 3 FPS improvement to 162 FPS average, but leaving the frequency stock and disabling SMT bumps the 3600 score up to equal the stock 9600K placing at 166 FPS average. We've observed in the past that Total War, Hammer 2, and some other games can react negatively to hyperthreading or SMT, so this is one way of leveling that out with the 6-core, six 6-thread six 9600K. We first broke this information in the first-generation Ryzen reviews, and it seems that this persists here. We wouldn't recommend actually disabling SMT, as the usefulness is a wash between games, some like it, some don't, and ultimately, it's better to have the extra threads. That is half the reason you're buying the processor anyway. This is more of an exercise to demonstrate behavior in Zen 2 versus the original. As for the 9600K, the stock performance leads the stock 3600 by 4.4%. They're close enough that other applications may matter more than this Delta. We'll look at production workloads later. The Total War 1440p battle benchmark is a GPU bottleneck, so we can't see any CPU differences until we get to the bottom of the chart. We'll move on from this one quickly and leave discussion for it in the article below if you want to read a bit more. The second Total War benchmark uses the campaign map as seen in the grand strategy portion of the game. It's much more CPU dependent than the battle benchmark, so we'll start with 1080p. At 1080p, the R5 3600 stock 155 FPS average shows a 7% improvement over the 2600 overclocked to 4.2 GHz and a 33% improvement over the stock 1600. This beats the full range of older 6-core 12-thread AMD parts, overclocked or not. Overclocking the 3600 itself was ineffectual in this test, as it was with the Total War Battle benchmark, but again, disabling SMT offered a boost to performance that made the 3600's performance around the stock 9600Ks both at 161 to 165 FPS average. That's stock to stock frequency. The 9600K has much more overclocking headroom with a 13% FPS improvement from stock to 5.2 GHz in this test, ending at an impressive 183 FPS average. The 1440p results aren't as GPU bottlenecked like they were in the battle benchmark, but that also means that much of the chart lines up with the 1080p results. The 3600 with SMT disabled lost some of its edge here, with the 3600 overclocked outperforming it slightly, and the stock 9600K just beyond that. So 1440p sometimes will matter for uh, the CPU choice, and sometimes it won't, like with the battle benchmark where we saw they all more or less equaled if you're at 1440p there with any of the top-end or even mid-range CPUs, 
you're going to be limited by the GPU choice. F1 2018 is up next, a DirectX 11 standard implementation of the game on the Ego engine. F1 2018 runs at higher frame rates than any human could require in our 1080p testing, but it still shows good scaling between CPUs. The stock 3600's 267 FPS average is again well ahead of the previous best score for the 6-core 12-thread AMD parts, surpassing the overclocked 2600's 235 FPS average by 14%, and the old stock AMD R5 1600 by 34%. Overclocking the 3600 again had very little effect, and he's done a good enough job at boosting per core frequency that it's difficult to improve the performance with an all core overclock, at least in lightly threaded applications like games. F1 is another title where disabling SMT raises performance, although not quite to the level of the 9600K this time. We climb to 273 FPS average with SMT off and stock clocks. It's possible that disabling hyperthreading would give a slight boost to many of the CPUs on our charge, but it's rarely worth going into BIOS and cutting a CPU's thread count in half for a minor performance increase in some video work in some gaming workloads. The only reason we're treating the CPUs differently is because it's a new architecture and we want to see if SMT overhead has changed in the past two years. Here's a quick frame time chart with F1 2018 at 1080p. Remember that lower is better, but more consistent is better than just being lower. Overall, the R5 3600 remains close to 4.3 to 5.0 millisecond frame to frame intervals. And typically we don't notice stutters unless there's an excursion equal to or greater than 8 to 12 milliseconds frame to frame, something that only happens once in this benchmark for both tests. And it happens on both the 9600K and the 3600 in the same spot in the same test. Overall, these two processors have similar frame time pacing and consistency with at least this game, with the 9600K faster by 0.3 milliseconds on average, frame to frame. 1440p F1 is next. The CPU is at 240 FPS average and above are almost entirely GPU limited, but all of our 3600 results fall just short of that range. The narrower range of results means that all three, stock, overclocked, and SMT disabled for the 3600, average to almost exactly the same. The 9600K still won out by 4.5% stock versus stock, technically speaking, although the value of the 3600 is a tough match for it, particularly in later tests and with the lower price. The top end of the results hit the GPU limit, so note that all differences are within error margins. That's why the 9900K OC isn't at the top, it's because they're bouncing off the limit, so any delta here is just run-to-run -run variance. We do multiple passes of the new Gathering Storm AI benchmark for Civilization VI, each of which takes an average completion time for five turns, and then averages those numbers together. It's the only game test we do that isn't measured by frame times, and the results are extremely consistent. We took a look at turn time instead, as this is entirely CPU dependent and heavily impacts how enjoyable the experience is. Unfortunately, despite being an AI benchmark, it shows a strong preference for frequency over thread count, as can be seen by the R5-1600 at 3.2 GHz base, outperforming the R7-1700 at 3 GHz base. The 9600K stock took 34 seconds to complete each turn, reducing average turn time by 5%, versus the 3600 stock. And the overclock to 9600K is far beyond the overclock 3600 in performance at 30.3 seconds versus 35.3. Multiplied across all five AI turns, that means it'd take an extra 25 seconds per turn for the human player to have input again, and that'd be more exaggerated as the game grows complicated. Assassin's Creed Origins has revealed itself to be one of the most balanced titles we test in terms of benefiting from frequency and core count at the same time. Disabling SMT had an appropriately negative result for once, so it's the stock 6-core 12-thread 3600 result that slightly edges out the 9600K by 1.1 FPS average, more or less within error margins at that point, so they are functionally tied. Interestingly, the overclocked results for the two CPUs are fairly close as well. The 12 threads of the 4.3 GHz 3600 bring it closer to the 5.1 GHz 9600K than we've seen in the previous tests, with only a 7.4% advantage for the Intel chip. The 3600 is also the first of AMD's X600 series CPUs to break 60 FPS in the 0.1% lows, which it does even at stock frequencies. At 1440p, the 3600, 3600OC, and the stock 9600K are all within error margins of each other. The results are pushed together closer by the GPU constraints for this one. The 9600K OC still has an advantage, but again, everything is clumped together a bit more. GTA 5 is next. The oldest game on our bench still has some life left in it, thanks to some settings tweaks to further load on the CPU, and it's also still one of the most played games on Steam. It's another title where disabling SMT allowed for a performance increase of a few FPS, but not past the stock 9600K this time. Frequency is important in this title, and the lack of major improvement with the 3600 overclock all-core settings indicates how close the stock boost frequencies already are to the maximum achievable all-core overclock. We'll be interested to see whether the 3600X can justify its $50 higher price with what seems like very little room for improvement. 
AMD's generational improvements are as strong as ever here with a 20.7% uplift over the stock 2600 and a 37.4% improvement over the stock 1600. Pretty good. Scaling at 1440p between 1080p and 1440p is almost perfect for GTA 5 with only the nearly tied overclock 2600X and stock 7600K trading blazes. The FPS numbers themselves are also barely changed, meaning we're a healthy distance from a GPU bottleneck or the observed FPS cap of about 187.5 FPS for this engine. You would have to go to a higher resolution or even higher settings to limit the GPU uh, down to a point where the CPU is bottlenecked. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is another one of the minority games we're leaving SMT enabled. It gives us a better result. The stock 3600 showed an 18% improvement over the average FPS and the stock R5 2600, but with barely any further improvement from overclocking. The generational improvements are big, but it's the same story as it has been. Manufacturers squeeze performance out of parts more efficiently these days, so stock performance goes up, and overclocking headroom can go down as a result. The 9600K is one part that still has some room left, and the 5.1 GHz OC put it 13% ahead of the overclocked 3600. Due to popular demand, we've switched to DirectX 12 for our Hitman 2 testing. DX12 support was patched into the game relatively recently, and any previously published benchmarks from us uh, in the CPU side were done using DX11. We use both 11 and 12 for GPU reviews. Note that DX11 has better frame time pacing and performance than DX12, but so many people seem to prefer the different graphics API that we decided to just move to it for CPU testing, even though the frame time performance is technically worse. Hitman 2 showed a reassuringly strong preference for SMT on rather than off, with a 7.9% improvement from the extra threads, slightly better than even the 6-core, six 6-thread six stock 9600K. Our testing with the 8-core, 16-thread 9900K showed much better results with hyper-threading disabled across multiple tests and retests, and 16 threads isn't exceeding some threshold because the 8-core, 16-thread 3.9 GHz 1700 outperforms the 6-core, 12-thread 3.9 GHz 1600. So it must be down to how Hitman 2 treats thread count. The 4.3 GHz overclock on the 3600 was as disappointing as it was in the other gaming tests, or most of them leaving Hitman 2's universally bad 0.1% low is unaffected. For this CPU, you're really getting so much out of the stock performance that a higher power consuming OC is getting tough to argue in the games. The R5 3600's out of box performance is highly competitive with Intel similarly priced CPUs already, including in games, and a big leap over the previous two generations by AMD. The 1440p results stack up the same way as the 1080p results did. 9600K OC is better than the 3600 OC, but by a smaller than usual margin. 3600 stock just barely better than the 9600K stock, and the 3600 with SMT disabled trailing well behind the normal 6 core 12 thread result. We can get into the production workloads next, including Adobe Photoshop, Premiere, Blender, V-Ray, GCC, uh, compi GNU Compiler Collection and uh, some additional testing. So our GNU Compiler Collection benchmark is basically a cache benchmark, something that's illustrated clearly by this chart. This demonstrates how quickly the CPU completes our code compile in the benchmarking. It is not, however, benchmarking the compilers against each other, nor is it testing the compile quality. The faster and higher core count CPUs, and especially Intel CPUs, would do better in other code compile environments potentially, but something compiling GCC with GCC is, as Wendell of Level 1 Text told us, quote, cache hits all the way down. In this respect, we can functionally use this test as an illustration of the impact of having so much L3 cache. By all counts, the overclocked 2700X should clearly win against an R5 3600 in pretty much every other test. If you happen to work in a similar environment to this, basically SigWin or MinGW compiling on Windows, the higher cache will help. We may have accidentally discovered AMD's new favorite benchmark, as one of our Patreon subscribers noted, and it's functionally a look at the cache. So a bit of a unique test, but not one that necessarily scales to the way most people would compile the code. We need to look into expanding this testing going forward. Moving on to the next one, our next benchmarks are for compression and decompression with 7-zip. With compression, the R5 3600 pushes 55,000 million instructions per second, or 55,000 MIPS, ranking it between the 1700 at 3.9 gigahertz and 9700K at 5.1 gigahertz. The bigger story here is that a 3600 at 4.3 gigahertz all core performs about where a 5.1 9700K does, and not distant from the 2700X stock CPU. Generationally, we see an improvement of 27% over the 2600 and 46% over the R5 1600 CPUs. Decompression is next. In this test, the R5 3600 pushes 72,000 MIPS, roughly tying it with a 9700K at 5.1 GHz and holding a strong lead over the price comparative 9600K, which isn't even in consideration at this point. 
Adobe Photoshop is next. Like Premiere, Photoshop prefers frequency first, performing transforms, warps, applying filters, color changes, and resizes. We see the 9900K illustrate what Photoshop likes in a processor. The 9700K's 5.1 gigahertz result being so close to the 9900K's 5.1 gigahertz result is useful for demonstrating that frequency matters first for Photoshop. The R5 3600 ends up nearly tied with the i5 9600K stock CPU, leading it by about 2%. Overclocking the R5 3600 gets it to 979 points, an improvement of just 2.3%. The 9600K with an overclock leaps by 13%, from 942 points to 1065 points. AMD's R5 can hold its own here, but frequency dependence in Photoshop does shift the recommendation to be less strongly towards the R5 3600. Blender 2.79 is next. This is a real application for 3D modeling and animation, and is the very one we used for our own GN intro animation of these videos, and for designing a lot of the GN products on store.gamersnexus.net. The GN Monkey Head Render gives CPUs a mixed but heavy workload to crunch. For this one, the R5 3600 stock CPU finishes in 24.8 minutes, ranking it as faster than the 8700K and just under a minute slower than the 5.1 GHz 9700K. Blender has an organic use for the high core count on AMD's mainstream CPUs and doesn't lean as heavily on frequency, though it obviously still matters. Generationally, the 3600 finishes the render faster than the 2600's 31 minute result by 20%, with the 1600's 35 minute result reduced by 30% on the 3600. The 3600 completes the render significantly faster than Intel's similarly positioned 9600K stock and overclocked results. Overclocking the 3600 ties it with the R7 1700 at 3.9 GHz, illustrating that AMD has brought $330 performance from 2017 to the $200 price class in 2019, but also highlighting that a used processor in the R7 class may be a good consideration if you can get it for cheaper, like maybe the 2700. The GN logo is a heavier workload. Not much changes, but the 9700K at 5.1 GHz moves up the ranks more than earlier, meeting the 2700X. The R5 3600 is close to both of these when stock, and an overclock gets it only a time reduction of 4.2%. Not much from the limited OC headroom in this one. Our Adobe Premiere benchmarks are next, using a 1080p show report project that we can hopefully show on the screen with A-roll and B-roll, followed by a 4K project that's heavily comprised of B-roll shots. We're rendering without the IGP in the case of Intel, so there would be some potential performance uplift if IGP use is acceptable in your organization and workflow. The 1080p show report renders in 4.8 minutes on the AMD R5 3600. As discussed in the past, Premiere and Photoshop are still heavily frequency dependent, but the 3600 does well to reduce render time versus the stock R5 2600's 5.9 minute result. An 18% decrease in render time stock to stock and generationally is a major lift where AMD needed it. AMD has been weak in Adobe Photoshop and Premiere previously, so the IPC and clock increase help here. For reference, an overclocked 2600 rendered the file in 5.5 minutes, with the 1600 stock CPU from 2017 rendering it in 6.7 minutes, making the 3600 about 28% less time intensive. Compared to the i5-9600K, a processor with comparatively fewer threads, AMD's R5-3600 finally begins to pull ahead in one of AMD's weakest realistic production workloads. Intel's stock 9600K and its 5.6 minute results sit closer to the R5-2600 at 4.2 GHz, overclocking the Intel CPU to 5.1, it ends up about tied with the 3600. The 3600 finishes in about the same amount of time as the 3.9 GHz 1700 from a few years ago, basically a 1700X for reference, they're more or less the same when overclocked, and not far behind the 9700K. The 4K render is a heavier workload. For this one, the i9-9900K predictably chart tops at 11.9 minutes stock. More relevant to our conversation today, the 3600 finishes the render in 14.2 minutes, allowing the more expensive 9900K a time requirement reduction of 16% when both are stock. The R5 3600 outperforms the stock 9600K with an 18% time reduction, pretty massive, and further manages to push a 7% lead or less time required than the overclocked 9600K. Generationally, the R5 3600 stock CPU outperforms the stock 2600 CPU's 18 minute result by about 20%, or about 28% shorter time than the R5 1600's 19.8 minute result. Finally, an overclock on the R5 3600 allows it to finish in about 3% less time than the stock 3600. V-Ray is the last production test for us. It's by Chaos Group and one that Workstation users have requested. This one measures in render time by minute, so lower is again better. The R5 3600 CPU finishes the V-Ray benchmark render in about 1.45 minutes, landing it near an i7-8700K stock render time and ahead of the 1.54 minute R5 2600 4.2 GHz render time. Generationally, the 3600 stock CPU completes the render in 16% less time than the 2600 stock CPU's 1.73 minute render, or about 26% faster than the R5 1600 stock CPU.
The R5 3600 finishes the render at about 23% less time than the Intel 9600K, illustrating that V-Ray does actually utilize the threads. Overclocking the 9600K closes the gap, ranking it at 1.6 minutes, but it's not enough. The 3600 with an overclock is near the 1700 at 3.9 GHz, and overclocking the R7 2700 would get you to about the R7 2700X levels of performance, or 1.25 minutes. This again shows you that there may be even better value in buying an older 2700 CPU on clearance and overclocking it. At least there would be for some workloads, like this one. Power consumption testing is measured at the EPS 12 volt rails before VRM efficiency losses, but after the wall, this is a much more accurate measurement than the wall and gives us a fairly direct read on CPU power consumption without all the variability and noise of the rest of the system. The AMD R5 3600 measured at 79 watts on the stock gigabyte motherboard with no overclock supplied. Our 3600 silicon is much worse than our 3900X and 3700X silicon, so the overclock requires 1.43 volts to hold 4.3 gigahertz all core. This lands us at 90 watts down the EPS 12 volt rails with all power limits manually disabled. This is the only chart that will contain the R7 and R9 data for our 3600 review. But briefly, the R7 3700X stock CPU consumes about 87 watts when stock and 103 watts when overclocked 4.3 gigahertz at 1.35 volts. Note that our voltage required here goes down one full step from the 3600, but core count has gone up. This is a silicon quality advantage, and that carries to the 3900X. Our 3900X could impressively hold 4.3 GHz all core across 12 cores at just 1.34 volts. This is really good. This nets a 170 watt power consumption, but more importantly, we're able to run both the 3700X and 3900X with a lower power consumption and lightly threaded workloads than stock or auto with the motherboard. The motherboard pushes higher voltage than the CPUs need, and so we can clock higher with lower voltage and power requirements and therefore heat requirements when working manually. We'll talk about this more in our 3700X and 3900X reviews. Hitman 2 quickly gives us another look at power. For this one, the 3600 stock CPU stays within AMD's defined spec of 65 watt TDP, noting that TDP on a processor box is slightly different than actual power through the socket, but not by much. We were outside of spec in Blender, but within spec for a more lightly threaded gaming workload. The 3600 measured at 52 watts, overclocking pushed us to 56, and the 3900X ran at 76 watts when stock or 72 when overclocked. That's not variance, that's not margin of error, that's not testing error, that's because we were able to pull lower voltage than the stock motherboard BIOS assigns by manually tuning it, but still pull higher frequency. Conclusions then, this is actually a pretty fun processor. Patrick did a lot of the testing on this and wrote half of the script. So we, I wrote the production section, he wrote the gaming section, and we've both come to the conclusion that we feel good about the R5 3600. This is a processor that we can confidently recommend. It is more or less superior in all ways to competing Intel i5 parts. Now, technically, the i5-9600K does perform a bit better on average in gaming scenarios. You can also overclock it further. So if you count overclock to overclock performance, yeah, it's in the lead. But the problem we have with the i5s now is the same one we've had with the i5s for the last two years, which is that they are much harder to defend at a purchase than, say, an i9 or an i7 high-end CPU, a couple, like the 8700K a couple years ago. And the reason for that is because uh, threads are artificially turned off on these, on the 9600K, and it has now gotten to a point that with some of the benchmarks we've done in the past and even recently, frame time consistency is just not as reliable on those Intel 6-core parts as it used to be. So interestingly, as a separate conversation, for those of you who've been in the industry long enough, and it's only been maybe eight years since this was relevant, uh, you might remember when people pretty much everywhere said an i5 is not for gaming. And I said that too many years ago. So we're now in a scenario where an i5 isn't enough for gaming for Intel, but an R5 is enough for gaming from AMD. It was just something we'll talk about more in our R7 3700X review. So the R5 3600 is genuinely good. It is highly competitive. We can strongly recommend it. And versus the 9600K, in general, we would prefer the 3600, and that's because uh, frame time consistency is reliable. We know it's almost always going to be good, and if it's not, there's probably some other problem with the software. We know that it is versatile, and not everyone needs the versatility, so this is something we recommend as a strong point, because 3900X, versatility is irrelevant if you aren't going to actually use it. So if you're only gaming, that's a different story. But for the R5 3600, having strong enough gaming performance plus the versatility, it just becomes an add-on feature. So that's something that's good. The value is good. It's $200. 
So that makes it cheaper than the 9600K, making it easier to purchase uh, or defend the purchase of. And we would recommend getting a cooler with it as we do with most CPUs, but technically you could get one in the box. So that is most of the 3600 conclusion. A couple of interesting notes here. AMD has become AMD's biggest competition now with these CPUs. So for a video maker with a stricter budget, the R5 3600 is superior to its immediately price matched competition from Intel. You may be better served though by purchasing an R7 2700 on steep sale and overclocking it. For perspective, if you did our benchmarking, that land you at our overclocked 2700X result of 4.3 minutes for 1080p Premiere, uh, and that would cost about $200, but that inventory will stop being made at some point, if not already. Even in the $200 to $250 range, there's no point in buying a 9600K if Premiere will be part of your regular activities, or any rendering software that can make use of more than six cores, like Blender. We'll be doing streaming benchmarks later as part of our ongoing Ryzen in 3000 coverage, but for now, we can at least say that the 3600 is the better choice for those who plan to edit and render footage. If AMD is its own biggest competition then, They've done a great job on the gaming side of differentiating the 3600 from the 2600 and the 1600 excuse or otherwise. There are significant generational improvements over the other 6-core 12-thread parts, with clocks being pushed closer to the max out of box. There's still freedom to overclock, but there's less and less point to pushing in an all-core OC on AMD parts at room temperature. We're hoping for better results from PBO, Precision Boost Overdrive, so stay tuned for that. The i5-9600K outperforms the 3600 in most of our game benchmarks, as games have been slow to ad adapt to CPUs with more than 8 threads. And the 5 GHz overclocking potential of the 9600K makes it an even clearer winner for exclusively gaming. But the R5-3600 is, again, more versatile, potentially cheaper, and the big question is whether the $250 R5-3600X that AMD is also coming out with can justify its $50 price point. Uh, because the 3600, if you can just overclock it on average to about the same point, then that's probably the better solution. But they'll be close enough. So this is a scenario now where, for the most part, we're recommending picking between a 3600 and an older 2700 for about the same price and overclock either one of them. Uh, or don't. They're, the 3600 is pretty good out of box. The 2700 definitely deserves an overclock if you buy the non-X, though. So yeah, those are your considerations. Go look at the old AMD stock first. It's good, and a lot of it is anyway, not all of it, but pretty good. And uh, competitive in pricing with Andy's new stuff. And if you're on less of a budget or you just want the newest thing, the 3600 is something we can recommend without any concern. So that'll be it for this one. Check back for our R9 3900X review. That'll be a heated battle versus the i9 9900K. And you can check back for our 3700X review after that. We also have a teardown of the 5700XT coming up today and a review of the 5700 XT coming up today. So that'll be it for this one. Thanks for watching. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly, by, like by buying one of our toolkits or our mod mats. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus as well. We'll see you all in the next video today.